Well, let me tell you, you are in for a treat today. We are very excited about having Dr. Judith Orloff here. Thank you so much for being here. So she is transforming the face of psychiatry. She asserts that we are keepers of an innate intuitive intelligence so perceptive that it can tell us how to heal and prevent illness. Yet intuition and spirituality are the very aspects of our wisdom usually disenfranchised from the traditional healthcare. Dr. Orloff advocates that a democracy of healing, wherein every aspect of our being is granted a vote in search for total health. I'm so an advocate of that. It is our birthright, both as healthcare givers and healthcare recipients, to reclaim our intuition, to build energy and well being. In response to her work, the Los Angeles Times calls Dr. Orloff a prominent energy based healer. Dr. Orloff is accomplishing for psychiatry what physicians like Dean Ornish and Mehmet Oz have done for mainstream medicine. She is proving that the links between physical, emotional, and spiritual health can't be ignored. Thank goodness. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> her latest book, The Ecstasy of Surrender, 12 Surprising Ways of Letting, letting Go Can Empower Your Life. She describes the power of letting go in everyday life, health and wellness, an enlivening, insane alternative to pushing, forcing, or over-controlling people and situations. Dr. Orloff begins by creating a bond of warmth, trust, and intimacy with participants within which they can hear and explore her ideas. Her sincerity, humor, and joy bring everyone in the audience with her, which is exactly what we experienced this morning, leaving everyone certain of their own intuitive abilities, as well as Dr. Orloff's contributions to a radically new kind of medicine. Let's give her a, a warm, warm, warm applause. Well, hello, everyone. I'm really honored to be here. I spoke at the earlier service as well, so I got to meet all the other that came earlier, and now you've come later. As you've slept later? Is that what it is? <laughs> well, I'm here to talk about surrender. Um, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm also an intuitive. So I combine, hello. <laughs> I combine traditional medicine with um, intuition, energy medicine, and spirituality. So I combine all of that together, and hopefully healthcare is moving in that direction. Um, it's kind of hard to really heal somebody unless you see their spirit. <laughs> no, it's, if you just look at uh, patients technologically with just your brain, you'll see this much of them. But as a physician, if I'm able to tune in with all that I have, including my body, my intuition, my analytic mind, everything, when I'm listening to you, when I'm in this group, when I'm listening one-to-one, -one, then I get flashes and knowings and sights, smells, sounds, gut feelings, senses of energy, and all kinds of other input along with what you're telling me. And so what that is, is that I listen with my whole instrument, and that's called surrender. No surrendering to everything, everything that you are, your mind, your body, your spirit, and probably much more than even that. Those are just words that describe you, you know, very generally, but you are multifaceted beings of light. And you have many, many capacities that society does not tell you that you have. And some of that includes intuition, and in the grander scheme, it means connecting to spirit on the deepest, deepest, deepest level. You know, surrendering over and over again, layers of separation shedding between you and spirit so you can feel the oneness between you, most importantly, with yourself and spirit. But even more than that, with every human being on earth, to feel the communion and the oneness with everyone, what keeps us divided is the mind. You know, when we think, you know, this one is different and this one doesn't have this, the same language or the same hair color, whatever, you know, the differences that add up 
but intuition and surrender, I mean, if you were really, if you could really allow yourself to like 200% surrender and feel the oneness of everything, you would be so ecstatic. You know, if you were able to really get that, you know, and really let go to that, that knowledge of oneness and that we're all one family. There's no way around that we're all human beings, so we're all the same packages, basically, here. And we're all one family. And from my standpoint, our purpose is to develop our souls. That's why we're here, period. The rest of it is secondary. You know, what your job is, what your family status is, even health status. You know, the, it's, it's all in service to developing your soul, all right? And what you choose to do for a profession or your work or what you're guided to do is, is important, but it's beneath that. You know, everything is under the umbrella of soul development, and that's the surrender. And that's very different than what our society tells you, isn't it? I mean, what society tells you is, you know, you're supposed to accumulate a certain amount of money and gain possessions and, you know, what else does it tell you? You know, and look stick thin and, um, hmm, and not age, as aging is bad, according to Western society. So, you know, it's, Western society is a very intellectually oriented society, so it's not in sync with surrender or intuition or spirituality, most of it terms of the mainstream pop culture, um, but you are, you know, here in this incredible community in Seattle, you are. And this book that I'm touring around on is called The Ecstasy of Surrender. And I chose those words very carefully. Ecstasy and surrender. The ecstasy, and I mean ecstasy, that it's our birthright. Everybody can feel that in the moment, not with large, gigantic things, but right now, you and I, this is it, in this moment, when your hearts are open, and you're connecting, and you're giving your full self to me, and I'm giving my full self to you, that's where it is. You know, it's now. It's not anywhere else, it's now. There's no searching. Now, if you can drop into what that feels like, what I just said, this picture on the cover that I chose, I really like it. It's of a woman dancing or flying over the ocean, you know, in total bliss and joy at the sunset with all the different colors, or maybe it's dawn, I don't know. But it's the extreme bliss of letting go. You let go to me, I let go to you. There's no guarding, we're here together. And then we can do that dance. Then we can, you know, have something really special. As opposed to a non-surrendered approach, if I was up here, in my head, reading from notes, telling you my academic findings about things. It may be interesting on a certain level, but your hearts wouldn't be engaged. You see, and when your hearts aren't engaged, your head is engaged. And you know, it's, it's okay, but it's not all of you. It's not all of you. Um, I, this book begins with a quote by uh, Ramana Maharshi, um, to surrender who you are for what you could become. And surrender who you are for what you could become. Always, you know, ongoing, never stopping. You know, who you can become. Don't let it be dictated by society you know, or Western medicine in terms of your healing. Um, have it be dictated by your intuition and your desire to surrender to the truth and what that truth is for you. You know, not what that truth is for other people, not what that truth is for, you know, all of society or, or 50 people tell you this is the truth, this is how you have to do it. If it doesn't resonate in you, it means nothing. You know, to really go beyond any kind of popular opinion and begin to tune into what is important to you in, in your life. What relationships do you want to have? Not the ones your mother wants you to have, but the one you want to have. You know, or what job do you want to work on? Or what part of the earth do you want to live in? You know, and maybe it's not practical. Or maybe it's not what you thought. You know, that, that's where the surrender is so hard for some people. You know, maybe you're called to go to Africa. Africa. You know, and here you're in Seattle, but my home's in Seattle, my family's, you know, all the practical considerations, and yet Africa is calling. What do you do? 
you know, what do you do? I mean, that's the mind-boggling dilemma. You get the call, and here it is, and, you know, you keep tuning in for guidance, and hopefully if you get a call anywhere, you go. You know, it's as simple as that. It's, it might take logistics to make it happen, but you, you follow that call. When I was in my 20s, I was working in the towel department in the May Company, and I had dropped out of school in my early 20s as I you know, was tired of it. And um, I was very creative, and I was you know, never, never scientific. And then I had a, and I came from a, a family of 25 doctors um, in my family, and both my parents were physicians, and I was an only child, and I was very intuitive and sensitive and quiet, and I had premonitions and predicted things as a child, and that scared me tremendously. I did not surrender to my intuition then. And um, so I, I tried to run from it for many years. That's part of my story, and how I've integrated it is part of my healing. Um, but I had a dream in my early 20s in which I was told to become an MD, to have the credentials to legitimize intuition in medicine. It's a crystal clear dream, and it was at a time when I had no desire whatsoever to do it. All right, because I, you know, all those years of medical training, plus I was terrible in science, and plus I didn't want to help people at the time. So, <laughs> oh, <I'm> like, hmm. <laughs> so what do you do with something like that? And I tell you for these things that will happen to you. This is just my thing. Uh, what do you do? At the time, I said, all right, uh, I'll give it 1% chance, I'll re-enroll in one course in a junior college just to see how it would go. And it turned out that it was a geography class, and I thought, hmm, well, how well interested will I be in that? But they talked about the moon and the stars and nature and the wind and the earth, everything I love. Hmm. And it was just an opening for me. In one year, one class became two, became 14 years of medical training, you see. So that little crack of surrender I had, little crack, I wasn't 100%. You don't have to be, you know. But the dream was clear. You see, the dream didn't have ambivalence. It was my mind, it was my personality, it was everything here that had all the ambivalence. But because I gave it a little crack of surrender, I let go a little to the possibility of Africa. You know, that was my Africa. And, you know, I found my destiny. Oh, I found my calling. You see, so the calling might be unlikely. It might not be what you were told. It might, you have smaller callings. It doesn't have to be a calling to go, you know, to medical school for all those years. It could be a calling to go to the creek. You know, just from, in my mind, just as important a calling. If the creek calls you, you go. Well, don't argue that you have all these things to do. Just go and learn from the creek. There's a section in this book on surrender to the natural world. I feel that the natural world can teach us a lot about surrender by watching water, fire, air, and earth, you know, by really attuning to the elements. Does water go up against the same boulder over and over and over again when there's an obstacle? No, it flows around. <laughs> you know, the art of flow. You know, you, you can look at the, the sky and learn so much about surrender. Um, all you have to do, if you are lacking in wonder and awe, if you're losing faith, you know, if you're getting bored with your life or you're stuck, all you have to do is look up. <laughs> See what's up there. You know, it goes up really far. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody looks up. They're all looking down or right straight ahead. But you have to look up a lot. You know, look up at night, especially. You know, go up to a mountaintop and where there's no pollution or lights and take a look at what we're involved with here. <laughs> you know, it's pretty hard not to have the awe and the Surrender to a large a force greater than yourself. People grapple with that. Now, someone asked me, what do you, at the break, at the book signing um, this morning, I said, well, I'm a mental health care professional, and I work a lot with um, atheists and agnostics. You know, how do I get through to them? You know, and um, isn't that a great question? He was in training. He wanted to know. I love that. Um, 
<laughs> very, very good question. And the answer is you just don't use the buzzwords. You don't have to say God, spirit, anything. You just talk about surrendering to being a good person, you know, or being of service to others, or being kind to yourself, you know, whatever. However you get there, you don't have to say God. You can, you know, I've seen some people can know God more intimately by never using the word than those who are very attached to the word sometimes. It's just the experience of oneness melting, going on the right path, and letting go to it. You see, if you hold and clutch and force things, what happens? Anybody? You. <laughs> the blonde hair and the blue. You. You're turning around. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> what happens? <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Will you listen to it? It's when you hold and clutch and force things and worry a lot, what happens? You what? I experience a lot of pain. Yes, pain, exactly. That's my point. That's why I was talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's intuition. I just wanted to point to you um, because. You know, when I look at people as an intuitive, it's really fascinating. As when I look at you, I see so much joy in you. And I see so much freedom and playfulness and connection to nature and surrender and how the worry gets in the way of that. You know, and the worry's thin compared to the rest of it, but it can really keep you away from the other part of yourself. So that, that surrender then, in terms of, of, for her, it would just be surrendering worry. You know, about all the little details. You don't have to worry about so many of the little details. Because if you surrender and you look up and you look around, you know, let's say that there's an invisible reality around us. And what do you think is there? You know, if you can surrender your, your ideas and your mind, well, what I think is there, there are all these angels all around you protecting you and all these invisible hands wanting to help you if you could open your heart and surrender to that reality beyond the mind. And if you can keep reminding yourself of that and keep having awe. And prayer is a form of surrender by getting on your knees if you can, if that appeals to you. A lot of times it doesn't, but if it does, and I'm a big kneeler and supplicator and getting down on the ground and all of that. But if you can do that and really you know, in reverence to something higher, to give your whole self devotionally to that, you can have a glimpse of other realities. And those realities are here to support you. But we have to call on them. Now, we have to be able to say, all right, I've done everything I can. There's not more I, I can do now. And I really think this person or this something would be good for my soul. And I don't know how to go further. I don't know how, please help me. You know, and deeply, sincerely go inward, and I don't know how, please help. You know, that prayer, that call for guidance and assistance when it's done from the heart, can you feel how powerful that is? You now, you might not always get what you want. I mean, that's true. <laughs> and one part of my surrender have been, has been over the years where I, I come from a Taoist tradition uh, and my teacher <laughs> told me in terms of my attaching to things he says, you have a really hard time when the universe says no to you <laughs> it was true <laughs> oh, you're not always going to get a yes on everything I mean that, that's the thing just because you, you desire it you know, you might not get a yes on it, but then what I found in my life, when I look back on the things I you know, just intensely desired but didn't get, I was really happy I didn't get them, mostly. There's still a few lingering <laughs> attachments, but, you know, but in general, I mean, I have prayed my heart out for things that were terrible for me, honestly, you know, at times. But you want them at the moment. So <laughs> it's just human. So I just want to show you how surrender works. Where if you're not getting something, perhaps that's the gift. And that's hard to get when you're stuck in attachment to things. It's very hard. But the point of my writing this book and why I wanted to spend four years on it was that I yearned for surrender in deeper and deeper and deeper ways. I yearned for the letting go and the freedom that could come from that. And I still do. 
But the, the surrenders might be unexpected when they come. And believe me, writing a book on surrender, I had no idea what the universe was gonna ask of me. I had no idea. I've had to surrender so much as part of writing the book. And as a result, because I'm a, I'm a student of surrender and so it's appropriate that I would have all these lessons because I asked for it. <laughs> but, you know, throughout, and, and I start, you know, in the beginning, you know, about what I've gained and what I've lost in terms of surrender. And I've, this is my fifth book and it's gonna be my last big book um, that I'm gonna write. I'll write smaller books, but not a big book because I really am at a point where I want a personal life. <laughs> and I deserve to have one. Yeah, and when you write a book for four years, this is my primary relationship. It is, as a writer, because I, I surrender. I throw myself totally into the learnings and the, you know, the, the great honor of writing a book. And, and this book has been extremely generous to me in terms of its teachings. But I've had to, um, in all my other books, I had a very quiet atmosphere. I lived in a condo on the beach, and everything was peaceful, quiet, beautiful. I'd eat my lunch, right, sit out by the ocean. This was very different because um, there was intense construction and noise all around me when I was trying to write, you know, with workmen all around and, and jackhammers as they were remodeling. Um, and I, I just couldn't bear it after a certain point. It went on for a few years. And I ran around to getting little writing studios, and then finally I had to sell my place because it was it's st still going on. I've been gone for a year and a half, and it's still having construction in that building. <laughs> it's crazy, but I'm very noise sensitive, so I had to surrender that place where I've written all my books, um, and I chose to surrender all my possessions. You know, in the midst of all that, because as I was moving, I just realized I didn't want them anymore. I've never had that desire before, but I, I went with it in the moment, so I gave away all my things to friends or charities, so I, I had very little material objects left, nor, nor I want to say, did I miss them. I never think about them. You know, they don't stay in your mind, material <laughs> objects. It's, you don't need them. And I surrendered a, a relationship. I surrendered a therapist. I surrendered old ideas I had about myself. And I surrendered, really, and this is the greatest victory, you know, what other people think of me. You know, if you can get to that place, that's a very worthy surrender, as then you can live your life. Because people have all kinds of opinions about you. And I, you know, ex I'm an explorer. I do different things, you know, in intuitively and in spiritual life. I'm an explorer. I like to, to see and find out for myself. And sometimes people have judgments about that. You know, and I, I came from a very traditional background where my parents wanted me to go to a country club and marry a Jewish doctor, basically. Which is fine, you know, it, it's fine, but it just wasn't ever who I was. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that was the pull towards leading that kind of a life, and I was always the road less traveled doing something else, you see. And so there's been a lot of opinions about my life and what I've done with it um, in the past, not so much now, because I'm so wildly happy and, and passionate about what I do and hugely successful and they see it's safe now. But when I started this, it wasn't exactly the safe path to go, <laughs> to go but I trusted it. You know, I trusted it and, and went on it. Um, and so I've given up all of that and as a result, I've gotten a lightness of being. I am no longer in a life that's too small for me and I didn't even know it was too small until everything shifted. You know, I had no choice. Who wants to surrender? I was happy. I stay in one place forever if I'm happy there. I don't need to move. I don't need a lot of change. But yet, the stable aspects of my life were shifting, and I was forced to surrender. And I could have fought with it the whole way, or I just decided, all right, you're writing a book. Walk, walk your talk. This is it. And it's a lot of change. And I went with it. And it's just so beautiful, the flexibility that I've developed, the lightness of being, um, the sense of adventure, the openness, the, the lightness. Um, I mean, I cannot tell you how much better I feel and just the adventure that surrender puts you on if you allow it, if you clench. And if you worry, if you fight the wave, let's say you're going through a wave, let's say, you know, it's a wave of change of relationships, let's say you're going through a separation or a divorce or your children are leaving home, or there's some big shift happening in your life, 
where surrender can help you is that it can help you flow with all those shifts, you know, instead of clamping down. What most people do is they get worried and afraid, clamp down, create disagreements or create problems with their loved ones, and they cannot flow with the adventure of what it is and the change. And what I'm suggesting is the exact opposite, is that when change occurs and things start to move in your life, you know, that you go with it like the water, you know, just like water. You be like the water and you open your heart, you meditate, you get centered, you keep connecting, and then you go. You just let yourself go. You don't hold on with your little toe. You go. No, no, I'm not saying you're holding. She uncrossed her legs. <laughs> but you go. You know when you're swimming in a pool and you push off from the side and then you flow with the water? That's it. It's not, you don't hold on to the edge and try and swim. You, <laughs> it's, it's about letting yourself go with it and trusting you'll be safe. And what do you trust? You're trusting something more reliable than anything else, honestly. You're trusting spirit. You're trusting the love that's everywhere in this universe, if the mind could be stripped away so you could feel things with your heart and see things with your intuition instead of just up here. You don't want to be stuck in your head. It's a place of torment up here. It can be. <laughs> this is where the pain comes from. <laughs> in case you didn't know that, the thoughts. Yeah, well, he's trying to shut it up. <laughs> All those voices. <laughs> There are like so many negative voices in the head and the surrender process is learning to compassionately say, all right, I have fear, I have worry, I have this, I have that. Fine, we all do. You know, that's the human predicament. But how we deal with all of it is the surrender process. You know, and learning to surrender fear and looking at it, hmm, my old friend fear. There it is. All right, how can I breathe center and then focus on an affirmation rather than waking up in total terror over something? Really, it's, it's a choice that you can make. It's sometimes like turning the Titanic because fear has this pull. And we so, as human beings, so naturally focus on the 90%, the 10% that's not working in our lives rather than the 90% that is. We focus on the negative. We naturally surrender to pain more or surrender to negativity and think about it constantly. Are you sitting around thinking about how beautiful the little leaf is by your chair? You know, or how beautiful your children's smile is, or how, you know, the line of poetry you wrote today, you know, what a fantastic line that was. I hope so. I mean, that's the best place to be, you know, as opposed to, mm, my back doesn't feel good. Mm, why isn't he calling? You know, hmm, you know, I didn't sleep that well tonight. Whatever, whatever is in your mind that's negative or difficult, you tend to focus on, it's just human nature. But with surrender, you wanna say, all right, no, I'm thinking about something else right now, you know, bye. So you can make that shift and, you know, practice going with the flow of what pleases you and what you're drawn to. And there's a section on surrendering energy vampires, people who suck you dry. It's important to identify these people um, rather than just let them populate your energy field in your life. You want to identify with your intuition people who suck you dry and people who give you energy. All right, I'm not saying judge them. I'm just saying identify who sucks you dry and then make choices about them, what you want to surrender to, what you don't want to surrender to, and forge your own path in relationships so that you can say no. One of the surrender techniques is just knowing that no is a complete sentence. <laughs> <laughs> You don't have to defend it. And, by, and we'll talk more about this in the workshop in terms of you know, the surrender techniques for energy vampires, but what you don't want to do is ever get into it with them. You don't want to have a confrontation or a dialogue with them. All right, that's where people get lost, where energy vampire pushes your buttons. You're not good enough. Why aren't you? It's you that did this. It's causing me to do this, you know, that kind of language. And, Instead of, I didn't do that, and this is why I didn't do that. When you're defensive, it puts you in a weak position. You don't want to defend anything. 
You know, you don't want to get into it. You just say, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't agree with you, period. And you begin to set the limits and boundaries, and you have to be the bigger one and come from a centered place. But the energy vampires want your energy. Just remember that. And if you respond in that way where you're upset or you're irritated or you're snippy or you're angry or you're doing something, they got what they wanted. That's, that's energy. But if you're firm and, and, and mature about it, it's really it's a form of spiritual and emotional maturity, you know, to have a choice about how you respond to people and really set clear limits and boundaries and the time your mind spends on them. You, know, you can do it in person you know, and really set clear limits and boundaries, but then if your mind wanders onto them, they still got you as you're giving them space. You know, they ping rent up here. You know, there's only so much space up there. So you want to populate it with surrendering to joy. The last chapter is surrendering to joy and ecstasy. And what I found is that a lot of times people can feel joy for a moment or be happy for a moment, like with the beautiful music, um, for a moment. But what I'm suggesting is that with joy, you surrender completely and savor it. And so it becomes a way of being. Now, instead of just an occasional occurrence where something makes you happy or it doesn't, to allow yourself, your whole body, everything, to feel the joy in, in this room as we're sitting here, in the universe, with friends, to feel the joy of the moment and savor what's going on in terms of small things. The surrender is the savoring as opposed to, oh, this is nice, I'm going on to the next worry. You know, but the savoring of the joy, letting yourself surrender and immerse yourself in, in the joy or the beauty or in nature or in meditation, to be able to surrender to your meditations. And when the mind comes in, to picture the thoughts floating by like clouds in the sky and bring yourself back to the breath. There's a three minute surrender meditation that we'll go through this afternoon, and I practice all the time, where you reboot yourself. You reset yourself three minutes throughout the day by going inward, connecting, breathing as we began this service with, letting go, connecting, and then coming back again and going ahead with whatever it is you were doing. But that surrendering to spirit or yourself, the, the devotional practice of soul development, you know, it takes a deep devotion to yourself and to your own soul growth to want to surrender the patterns that don't serve you. Otherwise, the ego will latch on to them and won't want to let go. But if you can be in devotion to yourself, the most important thing, and how your soul grows, then you can deal with the patterns that stop you from love. There's a section on soulmates, soul friends, and animal companions. Anamkara, you know, Gaelic for soul friends. You know, the, the connections you could make through love and how you can surrender to the love. And in the book, it talks about how to release negative patterns that stop you from loving. Now, that's important. You don't have to search for love. You just have to remove the patterns that stop you from loving. You know, such as being attracted to unavailable people. <laughs> yeah, because that could go on and on and on. You know, and how, how to stop that, you know, I, I talk about that, how to shift that and heal that, and, and what stops you from being with somebody who's truly, truly there with you on the journey, if that's what you want. And, and not, it doesn't have to be for everyone. I don't believe everyone needs a soulmate. It's not their path. It's not their path. It's just, but if it is your path, and that's what you want, then you have to look at what's stopping you from that, and we'll talk about also in the workshop emp empathy, where empaths, and I'm an empath, so I've studied this quite a bit, uh, are people who are intuitive, sensitive, open, but tend to absorb the emotions and energy of others into their own body and can get very exhausted by it. And in relationship, it can be difficult because you take on your partner's stuff and there's a fear of engulfment because of the whole energetic dynamic there. So we'll talk a little bit about that, and that often stops people from being open completely to another person for fear of being overwhelmed by too much togetherness. 
Yes, yeah, empaths don't like that much togetherness, like other combos. <laughs> it's too overwhelming for them. So these are just variations of surrendering to yourself and who you are, finding out who you are, surrendering to it, being devoted to your own practice, you know, on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. And sometimes you can't surrender wholly, but you can in the moment. You know, when something gets overwhelming, the surrender is always letting go of the negative story you tell yourself about it, like in five years I'll be destitute, you know, and coming back to the now. Because the, the negative stories are the torture and the torment and the causes of suffering. And if ever you're going through something big, you have to bring it back to the moment and deal with only that. Only what's in front of you. And always, as hard as it can get, the gratitude. You know, even when it's so hard, a friend of mine lost her husband to pancreatic cancer, and this was her soulmate, and she was with him for 40 years. And during the dying process, his dying process, I'll never forget, she wrote me, she goes, I'm walking up some, we're, we're walking up some icy cliffs, but we still look down and see the beautiful little red flowers in the cracks. You know, they're always there. You know, even during the worst of the worst, they're always there. And, you know, that's the miracle of life, the richness and, and the surrender to the, all the many things that can happen. In the earlier service, I'll, I've, I said, which a lot of people liked, is that you can be going through something miserable and be happy at the same time. You could be happy and miserable at the same time. Did you know that? <laughs> you can be happy with yourself, happy with your heart development, and miserable because of the situation. You see, so just be, you don't have to be totally miserable, is my point. <laughs> that helps when you're in it, I tell you, you go through it, it'll help. <laughs> so I think on that note, um, I'm going to end our, our talk, and I hope to see you at the workshop. And um, also, I, I'm giving a weekend workshop at Esalen and Big Sur on July 25th, 27th, for those who would love to come to the Big Sur coast and learn um, among na the natural world how to surrender to intuition. Um, so I'll be out for the book signing, and uh, then we'll meet again, I think, at 1 o'clock? Is it 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock? All right, we'll, I'll see you then.